I'm joined today by Xavier Gebex, who's this year's Keynes lecturer here at the Faculty of Economics in Cambridge. Xavier is the Pershing Square Professor of Finance and Economics at Harvard University and a fellow of the Econometric Society. Most of his research focuses on macroeconomics, finance and behavioral economics. Thank you very much for joining us today. Most of your research focuses on macroeconomics, finance and behavioral economics, but your lecture this year is entitled uh, Economic Networks, New Models, Facts and Identification Strategies. How is this going to fit into your broader research agenda? Could you say a bit more about that? So in part, I'm hoping to have a talk that can appeal to both you know, macroeconomics, financial economists, but also uh, more labor people and maybe game theorists who are interested, who are interested in networks. And uh, as a part of this uh, macro finance uh, long running uh, project, um, my co-author, Ralph Kojan, and I, we stumbled upon a new way to do identification in macro, but really in macro and in finance and in labor and in network economics. So I thought I would talk about that. And we call this method uh, granular instrumental variables. That seems super interesting. Um, and instrumental variables are a really common approach for lots of economists that we teach on, on undergraduate courses all the time. How is granular IV different to the common or garden variety that we all know? About? Right. So it's a kind of uh, instrumental variables. Again, for those who don't know what's an instrumental variables, you'd like a way to tease the causality. So we started with, uh, in our um, own thought process, with what's the impact of a flow into uh, the stock market? What's the impact of stock market prices? And it's a really, really hard question to tease apart empirically, we have a model of what's going on there, but we wanted also to, to look at it empirically. It's a very hard problem because if you see a, a flow into equities and then the stock market goes up, you don't know if it's the flow that when the stock market go up or maybe the fact that the stock market went up so people mechanically have a positive feedback rule and they, they buy equities. Or maybe there's a third factor, maybe good news in the economy or some segment of the economy, that makes both flows going into the stock market and the stock market go up. So that's the whole problem of causality. Uh, generally, in, in you know labor, I guess that's where it started, in instrumental variable, it's some disruption that can allow you to create an, an exogenous movement uh, of flows, something that's not caused by some third variables. And you can do that in a number of labor settings, like there was a change in uh, regulation, for instance. Uh, or, or the entry of China into the World Trade Organization. That's a, some sort of exogenous events. You see what happens uh, after that. But you really don't have that in, um, in, in macro in general, uh, especially in a high frequency macro or something that could happen every month or every quarter or every you know, day, week. Um, now, that's where the granular instrumental variables come in. We said, look, if you have idiosyncratic shocks to various segments of the market, so what's an idiosyncratic shock? It's some bets maybe you're going to make uh, to go in and out of the stock market, for instance, to be bullish or more, more, more buy or more, uh, sell more equities. Uh, the size weighted sum of those idiosyncratic shocks uh, will be uh, big enough to move the market. And also, that's the granular part, and also will uh, be a valid instrument to see what happens uh, for the aggregate stock market valuation. And so that's the, that's how the uh, granular instrumental variable ideas, uh, we first used it, but it's actually usable in lots of parts of uh, macro and networks economics and the like. And so that's what I want to talk about more, more, more in detail in that uh, Keynes uh, lecture. And in some of your recent work, you've found that in stock markets, the aggregate sort of elasticity is actually quite low. And this seems to correspond to sort of a non-economist situation that when people buy stocks, the prices go up. But it's also running quite strong against a lot of the models that economists often use. What was missing from existing models and how, how do you enrich them to, to help us understand inelasticity in stock markets? 
So in, again, so the, the common sense view amongst non-economists, if you buy stocks, uh, you know, stock market go up. Of course, then more sophisticated economists will say, aha, there's a bit of a logical fallacy there because if you buy a stock, then somebody else sells the stock. So on that, there are either no buying or no selling. It's just, uh, uh, you know, reshuffling of the same material. Uh, and then another semi-sophisticated view by economists, but the prevalent view is if uh, maybe you, Alistair, wants to buy, want to buy, uh, you know, 100 uh, pounds worth of stocks, then uh, everybody in the traditional rational model will sell you a little bit of their shares. And as a result, the price needs to move almost not at all to accommodate your demand. Okay, so to a first and second order, the price doesn't move because and the price remains the present value of future dividends. End of story. But in, of course, in practice, just intuitively, uh, most people are not active, or if they're active, they have very, very simple like, rules of thumb. So that's what we model in the in the theory, and and the fact that you're not very active, you don't really react to price movements. That's what economists talk, uh, call uh, elasticity, uh, how elastic is your demand. Uh, it means if the price goes up by one percent, by how many percents uh, does your demand fall? That's the elasticity of demand. And in, in a traditional model, it would be absolutely enormous, maybe you know uh, fifty or something like that. Whereas in practice, we find it's something more like 0 0.2. And both in practice and in theory, by the way. So we have a theory explaining why the elasticity is uh, so low, a calibrated theory. And, um, and the, the counterpart of that, of this inertia in quantities, it gets a very big, in, uh, very big activity in, the price, in prices. Because if nobody wants really to sell you the, the, the shares, then the prices will need to move a lot to you know, incentivize people to actually do uh, sell you the shares. And what we find is that if you buy, say, 100 uh, pounds worth of stocks, the aggregate uh, UK stock market, let's say, or, or our analysis in the US, but if it was the same coefficient, the aggregate stock market goes up, goes up by 500 pounds when you want to buy just one little 100 pounds worth of uh, stocks. So the Stock market this way is very reactive to uh, flows. And that can explain maybe some, some, some fraction, maybe a huge fraction of uh, stock market fluctuations and maybe other asset market fluctuations like exchange rates and the like. This way of looking at stock markets and how they move will have big implications for things like government policy and how investors should think about when and whether to buy and sell stocks. One of the um, policy tools that uh, governments have pursued uh, is quantitative easing for uh, bonds. So the central banks buy and sell bonds. The impact of that is it's not zero, but it's actually quite small. So bond markets are very uh, elastic, but potentially doing that for stocks would be potentially quite effective. So if our estimates also uh, apply to uh, action of governments, which is you know, totally plausible, then uh, at least in principle, the impact of uh, buying and selling by government uh, on the stock markets would be quite large. And indeed, a number of Asian governments have been pursuing these policies like Hong Kong and Japan and China, where often governments own something like 6% of the market and the equity market, and, 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 and they buy and sell in part to kind of attempt to smooth uh, or, or manipulate a little bit the market. Identifying these kinds of effects in stock markets is already very challenging, and, and that's one of the things that your granular instrumental variable sort of adds to the debate. What are the additional challenges when we look at a network? So first, uh, the market with supply and demand, it's a simple, very simple form of networks, and, and the granular IV there works in the following way. You have idiosyncratic shocks by a variety of uh, players in the market, let's say demand shocks, and you see how their idiosyncratic demand shock affects aggregate prices and affects the quantity of the other players. So that's in a simple supply and demand market. A network is, is a more general form of uh, you know, market interaction. Uh, and the difficulty is that, uh, say, you'd like to say, so conceptually, the idea, let's like, say, suppose there's a positive productivity shock by Apple, let's say. So 
uh, what, what's the impact on all the suppliers of Apple? So presumably they supply more, more, more goods. And what's the impact on all the people who buy Apple products? Presumably also they buy more goods. And, and so ideally, this, so again, conceptually, without doing any math yet, uh, if you manage to get an idiosyncratic productivity shock to Apple, then you can see, you know, what's the impact on uh, upstream in the, in the, in the network, downstream in the network, and it allows you to estimate loss of parameters, elasticities, understand how shocks propagate through the economy, that sort of thing. The difficult part of the difficulty is how do you identify such an idiosyncratic shock? Because Apple itself is shocked by uh, other, uh, other, um, uh, you know, its, its suppliers and maybe its customers. You know, so do they want or not the product, and who demands more of the product, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you need to to isolate the idiosyncratic shock to Apple. You need to also isolate the idiosyncratic shock to the other uh, parts of the economy around Apple. And so there's a bit of a circularity, and that's where uh, suddenly math becomes important because you can't keep track of all those things in one's, uh, in one's head. Uh, and, and then you can do it, helped by both economic intuition and then formal mathematical, mathematical theorems about what is it that you can identify, cannot identify. And in principle, we can identify lots of things in um, in macroeconomic networks and in general in economic networks. It could be trade networks, uh, currency flow networks and the like. And when I say network, it's really almost any economy with connected parts. So it's almost, you know, lots of lots of things in, uh, in economics where you now for the granularity assumption, what does it even mean granular? Uh, it means uh, a lot of it is get, uh, uh, shocks to the economy in part they due to gr incompressible grains of economic activity which maybe are the firms the big firms or maybe some of the big industries and uh, as soon as you have this feature some a few big players in, uh, in an economic system normally the granularity applies and you can form you can proceed to that sort of uh, identification strategy xavier a lot of your recent work is in the field of behavioral economics how does this Keynes lecture fit into that research agenda? Actually, I thought hard about maybe talk, talking entirely about behavior economics during that Keynes lecture, but I won't. I will just talk very briefly about it. And the idea is once you uh, visualize the economy of made of all of those different countries, all of those industries, etc., and you want to think about firms making fairly fairly sophisticated decisions then you see that, again, the fully rational paradigm doesn't work. Why? Because a firm in a traditional model without any uh, complicated network just needs to look at current prices, that's all. But even the network and, and leads and lags, then in principle, a firm needs to forecast, not only see all the prices, but also forecast all the prices at all horizons, including how the shocks will propagate to other industries. And so it makes that you know completely, completely... Uh, completely implausible. So one of the uh, challenges, modeling challenges um, uh, that uh, that arise very clearly from this kind of uh, macro work is how do firms with somewhat more limited rationality manage or try to uh, anticipate future shocks in a limited rationality work without having to forecast the whole network in their head. And uh, that, that's one of the uh, areas where work in behavioral economics, network economics, maybe like complexity economics uh, could be quite uh, fruitful and have some ideas on how maybe to make progress on that. Thank you very much for your time. And we're really looking forward to hearing your Keynes lecture in a couple of weeks.